Uh, good day, everybody. My name is Jerry Green, and I'm the president and CEO of the Pacific Council on International Policy in Los Angeles. We are delighted to welcome you to uh, uh, the most recent installment of our Global Speakers series, which is organized in partnership with our friends at the World Affairs Council in San Francisco. Uh, special thanks to Philip Yun, my opposite number up north, Carla Thorson, and all of our colleagues in San Francisco. I also want to thank our partners at the Iran Project uh, for their help in bringing this conversation to all of us. Sitting here in Tehran, uh, for us, this is a, a local issue, and I'm doubly pleased to be able to, to thank our friends at the Iran Project. We're extremely lucky today to be joined by two world-class experts on U.S. strategy, U.S. defense policy, U.S. foreign relations, and security issues in the Middle East and Iran in particular. Uh, the timing of this could not be better right on the, in, in the wake of the recent um, Iranian elections, uh, a new um, administration in Washington trying to resuscitate the JCPOA agreement and a variety of other Iran-focused um, um, activities. I'm really uh, delighted to, to welcome the Honorable Chuck Hagel. Um, I always think a Senator, he will always be Senator Hagel to to, to me and many others, but no less importantly, he is the 24th Secretary of Defense of the United States from 2013 to 2015. He is the only Vietnam veteran and the only enlisted combat veteran uh, to serve as Secretary of Defense. And an interesting datum for those of you who follow these things, pay attention to the diminishing number of veterans serving on Capitol Hill. Uh, we have the lowest number of veterans serving in Congress in, in decades. And the consequences of this uh, from a whole variety of perspectives is, is, is not uh, in, encouraging. Uh, Senator Hagel represented the state of Nebraska in the US Senate for two terms from 1997 to 2009. I'm equally as honored to introduce Barbara Slavin. Uh, she's the director of the Future of Iran Initiative at the Atlantic Council. And as I said earlier, when I talked to my friend, Fred Kemp, I run the Pacific Council, he runs the Atlantic Council. We remind one another, the Atlantic Council is not just about the Atlantic, the Pacific Council is not just about uh, the Pacific. And Barbara Slavin through, uh, Slavin, through her work and leadership of the Iran Initiative is a, is a, is a very um, eloquent representative of that view. She's the author of Bitter Friends, Bosom Enemies, which is a great title. Uh, Iran, the U.S., and the Twisted Path Towards Confrontation. She is a career journalist a, a, in, in, in the field of those of us who study uh, Iran, a, a household name, uh, and she has traveled to uh, Iran nine times, um, which is remarkable. So I want to turn things over to, 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 to Barbara. I want to thank her and Chuck Hagel and the Atlantic Council and the Iran Initiative and the World Affairs Council in San Francisco for being such good sibs. Um, welcome to all of you, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank, thank you very much for the generous introduction, and uh, my thanks also to all the various councils and projects and initiatives. Uh, this is truly a delight. Um, you know, Senator Hagel, Secretary Hagel, and I go way back, and actually my tenure as a diplomatic correspondent pretty much coincided with your tenure in, in the U.S. Senate. And one memory I always have, it was, I think, in the late 1990s, I'd just gotten back from a trip to Iran, and I got a call, probably from your aide, Andrew Parasoliti. It was the middle of a snowstorm. The Congress was completely shut down, but I was asked if I would come in and brief you on my trip to Iran. And so I came in, the place was, was empty, <laughs> trudged through the snow, and we had a long conversation about the Hatami presidency and what what uh, what I'd experienced, what I'd seen that I hadn't been able to put into my stories uh, about that, that particular trip. So that always stuck with me. And then, of course, later, when I joined the Atlantic Council, uh, there you were in charge, and uh, later the co-chair with Stuart Eisenstadt of a task force on Iran uh, and what U.S. policy toward Iran should be. So we have a lot of yeah. interactions and, mm. and intersections on particularly on this this yeah. topic so I guess let's begin with uh, with the elections um, you know it's it, 
So often the U.S. and Iran have been out of sync when we've been ready to talk to them, they haven't been ready, and vice versa. Now we have Joe Biden, who wants to revive the Iran nuclear deal and who is all about diplomacy. But in Iran, we have a new administration coming in in August uh, that has, uh, how should we put it, not a very friendly attitude toward the West or toward the United States. So how do you see the dynamic right now uh, between the U.S. and Iran? Thanks, Barbara. Uh, first, let me uh, thank Jerry and all the councils <laughs> as you have uh, covered that. And also uh, thank you, Barbara, for uh, allowing to be part of this. Um, you're exactly right. I think that's the first time we met when I'd ask for you to trudge through the snow and come <laughs> breathe me. And um, I uh, always appreciated that and it stuck with me as well <laughs> as, as to your knowledge, your depth of knowledge, but not just the facts, but you were able to kind of piece it together in a way that is kind of unusual and then our work together on the Atlantic Council. So uh, thank you again for continuing to do all this. It's, it's really important to have your voice in all this because of your experience and, and the depth of, of your knowledge. Uh, as to the question, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm no expert on Iran. I'm no expert on the Middle East. I, I may know a little more about all that than, than most people. Uh, but um, because I have followed it for so many years and been, been part of, uh, of actions and activities that relate to it, um, and I still stay very close to it. Uh, I think the answer, short answer to your question is, we, we don't yet know. Um, uh, we know where uh, Raisi is on policy that he's enunciated uh, clearly the last two or three days in his strident anti-West, anti-US position. But that's really in, in some ways not new. I mean, uh, Rumani was was different in that he was seen as more moderate, willing to talk, and uh, the supreme leader, Amini, even though uh, he is who he is and what he is, uh, he too is, is still saying we need a new deal if we can get the right deal with JCPOA uh, in the United States and the West. But the basics haven't really changed that much. Uh, I think we all felt that when Ambassador Zarif became the foreign minister, uh, things might take a little uh, different turn. And I think he, during his time, and he's still a foreign minister, has tried uh, tried to do that. But uh, things are going to have to, it's this way in every country, every situation, uh, they're going to have to turn on their own inside. One of the telling uh, parts of the election that I, I found, if these figures are accurate, was only about 40% of the people voted yeah. versus the last presidential election, close to 80%. I mean, if those numbers are anywhere accurate, that's a big deal. And it, it uh, reflects clearly the unhappiness of, of the people of Iran. And of course, they're going to be unhappy because of the lack of progress on, on any individual freedoms, uh, opportunities, education, uh, economic prosperity. Uh, they're in tough shape. They're in very tough shape. So I'm not surprised at the hardline rhetoric that's coming out now. I mean, that's the way they do it. That's their position. But I think we've got to look, uh, as you've always done in your reporting, uh, a little closer to the inside into the fundamentals of that country. Uh, my guess is that we're going to get a new JCPOA probably within the next six, uh, six weeks. Uh, I don't know that, but I think we'll be pretty close to it. Uh, then, then it'll be the most telling part of the relationship. Then what comes next? And I know what they've said about no off the table ballistic missile conversation, uh, support of Islamic uh, militias, Hezbollah, uh, so on. But I don't think that's a final answer uh, because the economics of this are, are playing out so significantly inside and they are a pariah country and as new generations come online it's new generations that change new generations change this country and, and they always have so uh, i guess that's a long way around to, to again go back to my first point uh we're not sure yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I think one of the things, though, I mean, there have been a number of changes, obviously, but uh, there's more continuity in Iranian foreign policy than there is in ours. And uh, how much damage did Trump do by pulling out of the JCPOA in 2018 while Iran was still in compliance? And how can any Iranian government trust the word of the United States? I mean, they'll have elections again in 2024. Well, that last part of the question is relevant because that's what the Iranians are saying. We want to guarantee mm. that if we do this act two mm. of the JCPOA, a new JCPOA, that you're not going to do the same thing in four years if another Trump gets elected. Uh, we want some kind of guarantee. Well, that's, that's a different story as to what our limitations are because it's, as you know, it's not a treaty. It's a presidential agreement. So we probably can't give that, uh, that guarantee. But to your bigger question, how much damage did Mr. Trump do? He did immense damage, not just uh, in pulling us out of the JCPOA, <clears throat> but the consequences of that, that rippled out to all of the, the signers of that. Mm. China, Russia, uh, our strongest, closest Western partners, the UK, Germany, France, EU, uh, it undermined every element of our foreign policy, every element of our diplomacy, er every element of trust in us, trust in our word. To, yeah, to, to yeah we're point. back, but for how long? For how long? And, yeah. and that resonates. Last four years, I've heard from so many ambassadors here and foreign ministers, defense ministers, former ministers that I worked with, uh, same thing. How can we now ever trust the United States mm -hmm. again? And what that means is they're more amenable mm. to adapt to China, to adapt to Russia, because they can't count on us. Uh, Mr. Trump talked for four years. He'd go before the United Nations every September. <laughs> America first, America first, America first. Yeah. Well, well, yes. I mean, every nation is going to respond in its own self-interest. That's not new. Uh, that's predictable. That's good. But to say it the way he did, the rest of you have lived off of us and been freeloaders yeah. and so on. You're on your own. That resonates. And we, we may all laugh at that here in the United States. Well, that's Trump being Trump. But, but as you know, Barbara, uh, foreign countries, foreign leaders don't laugh at that. Yeah. That's serious stuff. Yeah. You also raised China. And, and I mean, following you know, Iran, uh, Iran's uh, economic ties, as I have over the last 25 years or so, I mean, there has been a stark change, and this is one of the results of our sanctions policies. Starting around 2010, when we started loading up the sanctions on Iran, and this was on, under the Obama administration, uh, all of a sudden, the European Union was no longer Iran's major trading partner. It, it became China. Mm -hmm. And this has, of course, intensified even more under the second iteration of the sanctions. So I guess the question is, you know, apart from very basic relief of secondary sanctions so Iran can sell oil again and get the money easily, does Iran really need the United States? Uh, or can it very much turn toward China, focus on China, Russia, the neighbors, maybe Europe to a lesser extent, and, and they don't really care maybe that we haven't had diplomatic relations for over 40 years? Well, um, I mean, I, I don't know exactly how the Iranians think and how they calibrate this. I, I think I have some sense of it. But to your point, um, I think they understand the value of the United States, why the United States is so important. I mean, the, the, when the United States puts sanctions on countries, uh, that's a huge deal because that's, that's financial. That's a SWIFT system. That, that includes every element of trade, of, of supply lines, of every banking, of everything. And we have the power to hurt countries, the United States does. Yeah. And Iran has been hurt uh, by all of this. So yes, they have an alternative with China. And as you know, recently they signed a, a new deal with China on oil. Mm. And, uh, but that's not gonna bring that economy back, just the, it's the Chinese. And the Chinese play their own game as well. The Chinese use Iran as a lever sure. against us, against Russia. I mean, they play their game too. So they're not, uh, the Chinese are not benevolent and they don't have allies. Uh, you know, they have clients, uh, but 
they, and, and Rand knows that. And Rand's very smart. I mean, they've been around thousands of years, the Persian culture. They're very smart people, just like the Chinese, been around 5,000 years. And, and uh, so it's patience and they know how to do it. But I think there's no, uh, at least in my mind, there is no misconception with the Iranians as to how valuable the United States is to get the United States back into a deal, to start mm -hmm. lifting sanctions, lifting the sanctions on being able not, not just sell oil, but all kinds of transactions with Europe, exports, imports, everything, because that frees up uh, liquidity, that frees up the market. Yeah, yeah. Let me ask um, a more general question about U.S. policy toward the Middle East. I know that uh, Joe Biden, who's a good friend of yours, uh, uh, has made the definitive decision to pull out of Afghanistan uh, by September 11th. Um, the U.S. is also, I believe, reducing our overall presence in, in the Middle East, uh, at least a little bit, not mm -hmm. clear what the final numbers will be. How big a military footprint does the U.S. really need anymore in the Middle East on a sort of you know, perpetual basis. Couldn't we put people in Italy or Germany or Diego Garcia sort of over the horizon uh, and really scale back now? Or is that risky? Well, I think what you point that you just made is is very much behind the strategy of what the Biden administration is doing. Uh, I mean, let's analyze this in general terms in the Middle East uh, as to what assets does the United States have there and where are they? Uh, yes, we're going to be withdrawing some Patriot anti-missile batteries uh, out of the Middle East in about four countries. Um, the THAAD anti-missile, which is the system is the most sophisticated, will be taking that out of Saudi Arabia. But, uh, and we'll be dispersing probably troops as well as fighter aircraft uh, in different parts of the world, some of it to, to Europe. But we still have two huge bases mm. in the Middle East, Cutter. thousands and thousands, Qatar and Bahrain. Yeah. And uh, they're not going anywhere. I mean, they're, they're, they're one of those bases has about 12,000 people. And uh, we've got a footprint. We're in the Persian Gulf. I mean, we, our Navy, uh, we, we've got uh, a military presence um, in Iraq, uh, special forces in Syria. Mm -hmm. So. Um, we're not abandoning the Middle East, but to your point. What's the right number? Well, um, I, I don't know what the right number is, but to your point, it's a new day, new threats, new dynamics, cyber, yeah. cyber, cyber, cyber right. is the issue. Yeah. And if China is the most significant threat, um, and that's the way I think the Biden administration is looking at this, um, it was what the Trump administration was looking at. When I was in the Obama administration, we were very much looking at all of that too. So you've got to re reposition assets. Yeah. And uh, as I used to say, trying to explain Obama's position on, on uh, uh, moving to the Pacific, pivoting yeah. to the Pacific, uh, that doesn't mean that we're abandoning the rest of the world. We're not abandoning allies and partners. We're not abandoning commitments we've made. It's always a repositioning, it's adjusting, it's adapting. That's not new. Uh, that's happened throughout history, uh, long, yeah, but, long before the United States. And I think that's the answer to, to the Middle East. The Afghanistan thing is, is, a, is a different situation. Uh, still some, some of the same theory, but I mean, 20 years ago when I was in the Senate, when all this happened, 20 years ago, nobody came before our Senate Foreign Relations Committee Nobody I ever talked to from the president, vice president, secretary Rumsfeld on Powell on down that, that in, in any way or general, it indicated we're going to be there at least 20 years and put two trillion dollars of nation building in there. And we're going to, we're willing to lose thousands of men and women killed and wounded. Uh, that's the way it's going to be. Just the opposite. We'll be out of there by Christmas, Senator. We'll be out of there next year. Nobody ever envisioned this. Yeah. And we just got sucked deeper and deeper. This is 2021 is not 2001. Different threats, different dynamics, different situations, much like the Middle East, China. And I think Biden's right. At some point, you, you've got to stop this because we just can't continue to do this. And I'll give you one other 
more human factor this that most people don't realize or they uh, they they so think about it the men and women that we send to these to these zones iraq and afghanistan many serve six seven combat tours through that 20 year period in Iraq and Afghanistan, you just keep sending them back. Well, we don't have a draft. So you send the same people back, same people back. Sometimes the even their kids. Some, that's exactly right. The toll that takes on families, on suicides, alcoholism, abuse. I mean, th this, is, this is tough stuff. So we have to prioritize our resources. We have to prioritize based on threats, based on the general dynamic of our strategy and our interests. And I think, that's the answer, as far as I'm concerned, as to why the Biden administration, uh, I mean, obviously, Trump administration made the decision on Afghanistan last year. That's true. It wasn't just a Biden deal. That, that was a Trump deal. Yeah. And uh, the Republicans uh, didn't say much about it. And there were some that didn't like it and still don't like it. But they, they let Trump go ahead, do it. So yeah. it's a little feckless now for Republicans to be now <laughs> saying, Appeasement. Uh, uh, come on, guys. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I'm a Republican, so I can say that, but uh, <laughs> come on, you know, it was your president who started this, but it's right. It's the right thing to do. And yes, there's, there's risks. There's going to be bad things happen, uh, but we don't want to end uh, this relationship. I saw the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff's testimony this week or last week, uh, like we did Vietnam. Let me ask you about bipartisanship because there's been precious little of it certainly when it comes to domestic policy uh, over the last few years and and foreign policy too has been politicized uh, at times terribly um, how do you see that now you mentioned the Republicans are not making a, a big stink about the withdrawal from Afghanistan I don't think they're making a big stink about the U.S. trying to get back into the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action either. I mean, there are little there are rumbles here or there, mostly from Republicans who wor worked in the Trump administration who have presidential ambitions like Mike Pompeo or, or Nikki Haley, um, uh, Tom Cotton maybe a little bit. But I don't hear the screams of outrage uh, that that one would have expected. Do you think there is some kind of consensus building on on Iran? Uh, that's bipartisan? Um, I don't see it yet. I mean, I go back to the Obama administration, and during that time, I was Secretary of Defense. Yeah. Uh, so I was well aware of everything that was going on and, and, and helped. Uh, when they did that deal in 2015, that was all. There, <laughs> there, there were Republicans who said, we're opposed to it, it's a wrong deal. But there were some Democrats, too. Yeah. There were some Democrats too that, that uh, thought it was wrong. Um, I think that that hasn't changed. I think a lot of Republicans, for the reasons against Obama, and now you have Biden, yeah. uh, uh, are, are saying it's, it's, it's the wrong thing to do. How much of that is politics? How much is that is trying to uh, destroy a, a Democratic president's foreign policy? I think there's some of that in there. Yes, uh, you mentioned uh, at the beginning of your question about what's happened to our country when it comes to bipartisanship on in foreign policy. Well, when I first got to the Senate in 1996, and we still had that. I mean, you didn't go to another country, a Democrat or Republican, didn't make any difference, and start bad-mouthing your president yeah. in, in another country. You, you just didn't did do that. You could disagree with the president on whatever, and I did plenty of times with both both. Uh, Clinton and Bush uh, and Obama, uh, but you, you don't go uh, say it on the, on the Senate floor or, or overseas. I mean, there are places to uh, to question a policy, and there's nothing wrong with questioning a policy. That's okay, absolutely, you should, but it should be done in a way that it's in the interest of our country. What is a better solution? And not not just the same. Not addressing the problem is not a better solution. Problems don't get better, they get worse, especially on, uh, on the world stage. They only become more complicated and they become worse. So if, if you're gonna criticize, question, then give us an alternative, give us something better yeah. than the JCPOA. If that's how, how then do, you, do we stop nuclear proliferation in Iran? How do we do that? Yeah. Um, 
I, I didn't see anything else come out of the, the Republican caucus <laughs> on, on what their answer was to that. So yes, unfortunately, things have changed in a way that's more dangerous for our country because we, we, there's an old saying, and you, you know this old saying, that, that politics stops at the, at the water's edge when it comes to national security and foreign policy. I, I, I was criticized by many Republicans uh, when I became uh, President Obama's Secretary of Defense. Why is a Republican, why, why a Republican do that? Well, I wasn't the first, by the way, Bill Cohen sure. was uh, President Clinton's. My answer was, National security is not a Republican or Democratic issue. It, it, it's a, an American issue. It's security of our country, our children, and, and everything else. So I don't know. We've 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 lost that. It, it, partly, I think, not all it, not all of it, but what Jerry said earlier, that the lack of veterans mm -hmm. in our Congress. I mean, I don't. I think it's around 16 percent of the Congress now are veterans. I mean, that that's astonishing. It doesn't mean veterans are smarter or better or better looking or anything else, but, but they do bring a perspective. Sure. When, when you want to go in and invade a country and occupy a country, you better talk to some veterans how the, the, who've been in one of those deals, how, how that plays out. Because as I've often said, there, there's no glory in war. There, there's no bring them on or uh, awe, you know, awe, uh, shock and all that nonsense. It's just suffering. It's suffering, suffering, suffering. And it happens to us too. So I'm not saying that it's all veterans not being in Congress, but I think it's an accumulation of all of these things together that, that's uh, really kind of short-sighted our thinking in this country when it comes to foreign policy and our interests. Because last point I'll make, we live in a totally interconnected world. It, it isn't just the United States. I mean, we are affected by everything that goes on in the world. Pandemic, health pandemics. The, the, this virus that we've been dealing with, COVID virus, is not a U.S. problem. Yeah. It's a pandemic. Environment, trade, supply lines, security, intelligence, that's all worldwide. And I don't think we've adjusted to that enough, and I don't think a lot of our leaders have put it in, in the right perspective. Let me ask another question about dealing with Iran. We were talking before uh, the broadcast about how you used to go to New York yeah. and meet with uh, Javad Zarif when he was UN ambassador. Uh, and of course, many journalists did as well. He was a, a great resource to get a sense of where Iran was going and also to, to convey US ideas. Um, with this Raisi uh, character coming in, I mean, the man is under sanctions for human rights abuses going back to 1988 when he was a young prosecutor uh, and was one of four people who signed off on the summary executions of about 5,000 political prisoners. Yeah. He's been head of the judiciary more recently and of course there have been executions of minors, uh, very severe repression of, uh, of dissent in Iran over the last few years. How, how should we handle him? How should we communicate with him? Should the personal sanctions on him come off so he can come to the United Nations, as mm -hmm. has been the tradition at least for the last 25 years? Uh, should we seek other interlocutors? Uh, I don't even know if he would want to come, frankly, given his views. Do we have to go back to track two mm -hmm. and the good offices of you know yeah. the Scandinavians and the Swiss and, and whoever else? Well. Um, that's going to be a, a big issue that this administration is going to have to deal with, mm. how you deal with what you have just said. Yeah. Uh, and I've always taken the view, uh, with, with, this is a different situation than we've, we, we've seen before with a leader mm. of a foreign nation. Uh, I've always taken the view, uh, and I think President Biden has, as, as many years as I've worked with him, been all over the world with him, and how well I know him, You've got to engage yeah. uh, because, as I said earlier, things don't get better. Yeah. They only get worse. I mean, you, you can make every excuse not to engage because he's a bad guy. He's done all these things. True, true, true. But at, at some, some point, you got to realize he is the elected leader of a significant country. Yeah. I mean, that, that's the way it is. We may not like it. Uh, Putin probably wouldn't be our choice. She wouldn't be our choice, but that's the way it is. Um, and so you got to engage. You got to deal with them. Then, then how you deal with them 
is 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 the critical part. Uh, what President Biden has said, Secretary Blinken has said, what the Biden administration is, is going to do and focus on is is statecraft. Mm -hmm. Well, that's diplomacy, as you know, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, not threats and, and not all the rest. Now we have all the, the tools that we can use. Sanctions. We've got all uh, more. We've got more options than any, any country in the world because we're better, we're stronger, our economy, I mean, in every measurement, we are stronger. Uh, so we've got a lot of options. How we use those options to deal with a leader like him uh, is gonna be the issue. Do okay. we do this wisely? Uh, you know, diplomacy, as you know so well, and statecraft is, is not done in newspapers, yeah. in television, and headlines. I mean, you can use that to your advantage to position mm -hmm. things, and get messages across. But the hard work goes on in back rooms and goes on and it's hard work, you know, hours and days and years to get things done. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the Biden administration will approach, I mean, him, right, easy, uh, uh, with the same kind of thinking that, they've, that they're showing so far in the first mm -hmm. four months of his, his presidency. They, they weren't surprised, I don't think, by, no. uh, by the, his uh, election. Um, so bottom line to me is you've got to engage. You've, you've got to deal with him. Yeah. Rich yeah. Armitage, who uh, used to be Deputy Secretary of yeah. State for Colin yeah. Powell, always said yeah. that diplomacy yeah. is the art of having the other guy have your way. <laughs> which, <Yeah. laughs> which was, you know, yeah. and he was always a great, a great uh, yeah, proponent, is, as, as was Colin Powell. Yeah. You, you got to try. Yeah, no, that's yeah. right. Those, those two are two of the best. And yeah. both of them are close friends, dear friends. I'm, I'm having lunch with Armitage next week, by the way. Please give him my regards. I will. Uh, he was uh, he was a character, but yeah, uh, he was he uh, is a, still is a character. <laughs> but but they understood it, and yeah. that's why they were so effective yeah. and so yeah. good. We we have another resource too, and that's Bill Burns. Yes, uh, who has spent more time probably dealing with Iranians in back rooms than <laughs> than many Americans. And uh, uh, there was a report actually that he was in Iraq uh, a month or so ago, and I have been told that he met with more than just Iraqis, but you know, uh, he certainly, he started the back channel we had with Iran uh, under Ahmadinejad. Yeah. So another yeah. hardline uh, president. So yeah, I would imagine they will find ways uh, to engage. No, and, and, and that's a good point you bring up because the Biden administration so far, when you look at their their leaders, their foreign policy, security, intelligence leaders. These are very experienced, seasoned people. Yeah. You mentioned Bill Burns. I mean, Tony Blinken, uh, Rob Malley. I mean, you go right down the line. I mean, these are these are new kids on the block. Yeah. These people have been around, and they're highly regarded and respected, not just here, but overseas, sure. in other countries. And that makes a big difference, a huge difference in in. And if there's anybody who really understands that is Biden. I mean, with the experience he's had yeah. in foreign policy, no president we've ever had could, could and match those credentials. Yeah. And he understands it. And getting the right people mm -hmm. is key to, to this. Yeah. Do you still talk to Joe Biden from time to time? Or yeah, is, I do, is he but too busy? <laughs> well, he's too busy for me. But, <laughs> yeah. but no, we, we stay in touch. And yeah. 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 No, it's good yeah, to know. A, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm totally biased, uh, but, but he's a special guy. I've always... Uh, believe that this country is, is is incredible for many reasons, but somehow we we find the right leader at the right time, at the right time yeah. for our country. I mean, whether you go back to George Washington, he started it all, yeah. walked away from power after eight years. No, they want to make him king, then emperor yeah. for life, whatever. No, no, no. Abraham Lincoln, Eisenhower. I mean, it's yeah. it's really right down the line. And well, there have been a few it, exceptions. Well, I, think, I said yeah. it. Well, that, but I said at the right time. I, I, I didn't. I didn't put every president in that category. Right. But I said at the at the right time. And I think this is a defining time in our country. Yeah. I think what we're going through now and have been the last few years, and what's into the future, a very defining time for this country and the world. Yeah. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Um, I'm beginning to to run out of questions, so That's, I know that, that, that never happens with you. Oh, uh, you know, I'm a little rusty. I haven't, yeah, I haven't been I haven't been uh, interviewing people for a while. I've been too busy with my day job of you know pontificating yeah. about <laughs> Iran. So um, I know that uh, that we have people who are who are registered online, and that this is actually a Zoom, even yeah. though. 
for the first time in a year and a half, I don't have to press any buttons or anything like that. So uh, I don't know if, if people are beginning to, to put questions into the, the Q&A box uh, or, or not, uh, perhaps not yet. Haha. -ha. Okay, you here's a you question. Don't have to answer anything now. Yeah, you're... yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I don't know who these questions are coming from, so my apologies to the audience. I can't, I can't put a name to to the questions, but they're they're already here and they're really really good. So let's start with this one. Will Israel's opposition to the JCPOA play a significant role in the negotiations with Iran? Um, I don't think so. They were opposed to the original JCPOA. Netanyahu was very much opposed to it. As a matter of fact, if you recall, he came to the United States and uh, addressed the Congress. <laughs> yes, he did. And, and, and spoke against it and did not tell uh, President Obama uh, or, uh, President, or, or Secretary Kerry mm -hmm. or anybody else. Uh, that was unprecedented. I mean, we've never ever seen that before. So. Uh, they'll uh, stay opposed. Their new government's uh, opposed. Um, I think their position is wrong uh, on it, uh, but that's their position. But I don't think that's going to stop uh, anything. It didn't stop it uh, before, and we've known what their position is. We, Israel's still a strong ally and a friend and partner, and we, uh, we deal with them and we'll continue to deal with them. But this, uh, this time, I think they're wrong, and I don't, I don't think it'll have an effect. What if the best we can get is, is a return to the original deal? What if the Iranians really do mean it when they say no longer stronger, no, no missiles, no regional intervention? Uh, is, is that still worth doing? Yes, it is still worth doing, I think, because, first of all, that's not new. That was their position leading up to the 2015 signing of the original JCPOA. Uh, that's all off the table. Yeah, yeah. And, and one of the reasons that the Obama administration went forward with it is because uh, the president felt, we all felt, that uh, the nuclear issue was the, was the most important and critical issue mm -hmm. to deal with. And if we could get an agreement that was a good agreement, and that was a good agreement, on that, then, then maybe that would build some trust, some confidence, that, that, that we could get on to the two other issues, yeah. ballistic missiles and uh, the support of, uh, of uh, militaries uh, sponsored uh, sponsorship of militias in the, in the Middle East. No guarantee of that, but the Iranian people would see the benefits yeah. start to flow into their country, economic benefits, trade, exchange programs, and, and you could eventually get to that. It, it would be in the interest of the Iranians. Uh, again, there's no, no guarantee of that. But in any negotiation, you don't start with the differences yeah. if you want to do a deal. Uh, and I think that's the approach he took with Putin, probably. Yeah. Uh, I Probably in his conversations with Erdogan of Turkey. Yeah. Uh, where can we agree? Where, where can we build a platform yeah. of consensus? Then you work from that outward. To deal with all the big problems and all the big differences that you have but if you don't have that platform yeah. where you've got an original agreement that, that can maybe build some trust and a little confidence uh, then you'll never go anywhere it'll just get everything will get worse and worse and you accomplish nothing yeah. not only the nuclear deal but nothing so i, I think that will be the continued approach uh, the hard line they're taking on those two issues is not new as i said yeah. I, I would expect them to take that hard line I mean, that's a negotiating factor and it's an issue and it's not new. Well, okay, we'll have to work our way through all that. Yeah, and, and we should point out that the JCPOA, even the original, would prevent Iran from having enough fissile material for a single nuclear weapon until 2031, which is, you know. It was pretty significant. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, my answer to that was when I heard from all the criticism on, well, it's just 13 years or whatever. I said, well, let me say, let me ask <laughs> it's you. It's a long time. <laughs> You're so smart. You tell me what the world's going to look like in 13 years. What's Iran going to look like in 13 years? Uh, yeah. Come on. If you can buy 13 years of real progress and for the first time having our inspectors, never before we've had that opportunity, to be all over Iran on the ground in those facilities, 
plus a lot of other advantages we got as a big deal. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see what else we got here. Um, yeah. Can you talk a bit about the very real nuclear threat in regard to Iran? I think we've we've yeah we've talked about. I don't know. I mean, one one question actually. We were debating this. We had an event at the Atlantic Council yesterday, talking about the results of the elections and so on. The question came as to whether Iran really their weapons or whether they had kind of milked this issue. Uh, in terms of sanctions relief, uh, I mean, they're already, they have the knowledge, everybody knows they already uh, have that hedging ability. Do they really actually need nuclear weapons? And we've also seen the Israelis quite capable of going in and killing Iranian scientists, sabotaging Iranian infrastructure. So, I mean, will they ever really get a bomb? I guess is the question, JCPOA or no JCPOA? Well, uh, I can't give you a real definitive answer on that. I mean, it's all subjective and speculative, but there's no question that the Iranians use this as, a, as their, their most significant leverage issue to get what they want. Uh, I mean, North Korea is not unlike that too. Does North Korea really, I mean, really need a, a nuclear yeah. weapon and so on and so on? So the kid. But they went all the way. But they went all the way. So. So it's different. So it's different. But it's the same same kind of thinking. It's leverage that that, that that Kim continues to use. You know, and like his latest warnings. But staying in Iran, uh, it, there's no question. It's leverage, um, and and I think that as you see new generations ascend power, and the old ayatollahs leave. I suppose there'll always be an old Ayatollah. I mean, a 60-year-old Ayatollah now, yeah. 85. That's a young Ayatollah. That's yeah, a young Ayatollah. <laughs> but uh, it's changing. Like I said earlier, generations change society. They change culture. They change countries, governments. And um, I, I think the value, the jeopardy of that value is going to be more and more on the table with the, the younger generation mm -hmm. whose focus is totally different and we really need these but i think this is now it's it's so ingrained in uh, revolutionary forces of the ayatollah the supreme leader i mean well they've said it's against islam to have a bomb i mean that's yeah, what they say yeah that's what they say <laughs> uh that's what they say so yeah. there's a lot of contradictions to your point yeah. on this but i don't i don't see anything in that regard changing anytime soon. I think they're going to have to stay with it. The, 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 having that bomb, having that nuclear, nuclear capacity is still critical for our survival. Yeah. Having, the, having the capacity, having the Absolutely. I, I think that it's going to be for a while. Having enrichment on their soil. Yeah. That's right. I think that they see that as a huge thing for them. Yeah. And I don't see them giving that up anytime soon. We have a question about the Abrahamic Accords uh, that were signed uh, under President Trump, the agreement between uh, to recognize Israel on the part of the UAE and Bahrain, a couple of other countries, Sudan, Morocco, I think. Um, how important was that agreement? Uh, do you see it as part of some sort of uh, new Arab-Israeli alliance against Iran, or do you think that was very much overblown? Well, the way I, I have seen that, um, and I, I think overall that was it was good. It was a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of those Israeli relationships, especially with the UAE, mm -hmm. uh, already were under the table being done. Trade, wink, wink, yeah, yeah. Uh, deals, money deals. Uh, MBZ has been very, very, very... Uh, clever in how he's used uh, UAE's positioning for a little country. He's positioned them in, in very significant ways with, with, with the big boys and girls around. Um, so a lot of it wasn't in reality new. It brought it up on the table. Mm -hmm. But a lot of that stuff been going on underneath the table for a long time. But I think it's significant in that it sets a direction. It sets a, a motion. Mm -hmm. It isn't going backward, mm -hmm. it's going forward with trying to ease tensions, trying to bring Israelis uh, and Arab governments together, 
their people trading exchanges. I mean, that's all, I think that's all good. Um, and uh, you can quibble with how it was done and what were all the motives and so on. Yeah. But uh, overall, I think it's good. I'm glad, I'm glad it happened because I think it's, it's one of those things that you can build on. It's, it's not that tangible that you build everything around or on. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the Middle East today, Turkey talking to Egypt. The Iraqi Prime Minister, Saudi oh, Ambassador back in Qatar today. <clears throat> that's another one. The Iraqi Prime Minister uh, holding meetings with the Iranians and the Saudis. Yeah. Um, a new government in Israel. Um, so, so things yeah. are starting to move in the in the right direction. Now, the Middle East is, is still full of of huge problems and volatility and danger. I mean, oh, it's a mess. It's never been a, a biggest mess as it is now. Lebanon, Libya, Syria. Yemen, Syria. I mean, you go down through it, but there are some signs that it's moving in the right direction. And I think the Abraham Accords are, are, can be seen as part of that. And I think going back to Biden seeing this yeah. as a foreign policy thinker yeah. uh, and practicer uh, and the people he's brought in come from that too. Yeah. I think if anybody can make something out of all that movement in that direction, I think it's this guy. It isn't going to happen fast. It's not going to be in a year. Mm -hmm. But it, as long as you can keep moving it in, in mm -hmm. the right direction and not regressing back to more and more wars, more conflict, more problems, everything that we've seen, then I think that's good. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask for your views on, on Saudi Arabia and where it's going under Mohammed bin Salman. He's had a, a rather rocky... Uh, uh, beginning, certainly, yeah. in, in terms of power. And, uh, uh, of course, Jamal Khashoggi is somebody that many of us knew quite well, uh, yeah. uh, brutally murdered by the Saudis in, in Istanbul. Um, is he going to be able to lead this country uh, properly? Uh, I mean, it does seem as though he will take over, although nothing is ever certain yeah. in Saudi. Well, I think that's an open question about yeah. whether he's going to continue to be able to, to lead the country. Uh, I mean, you know, intrigues, conspiracies were invented in the Middle East, truly. Mm. And, and uh, so you never know exactly what you're getting and what you think you're getting, you're not sure of it, and this person's word and so on, because the Middle East is still very tribal. I mean, mistakes that we've made in foreign policy over the years, especially the last 20 years, is us not rec recognizing it. Afghanistan is still tribal. tribal. I mean, their parliament doesn't make decisions. It's the lawyer Jirga. It's, it's the tribal council chiefs meet and make decisions. Uh, that's why Afghanistan has, has never been conquered by anybody, never had a central government that's worked. They had a Kabul government, but that, that's all. The Middle East is still tribal. Uh, the 1923 act with the British and French that divided the yeah. Middle East uh, it divided it in ways that made no sense because it cut across tribal lands. So you're still dealing with tribalism and they make decisions on that, on that basis. Uh, th that doesn't mean you can't have democracy at some point, but look at the monarchies still, yeah, totally. still. I mean, active monarchies that rule yeah. there. Uh, so that's what you're, you're, you're dealing with. And MBS where he fits, I mean, I think we've seen his stripe pretty clearly the last four years. Yeah. Uh, I think he's, I don't, th I think he's one cut ab above a thug. Uh, and I think that's just reality, what they did, not only to Khashoggi, but uh, what he's pretended to do to liberalize and yet throw women in jail and torture them uh, and not be honest about it. Uh, and I think the Biden administration has been pretty clear to him, and I think yeah, kept him at arm's length. Yeah, and, and I think that's what you're going to continue to see until you start to see some changes in Saudi Arabia, if there are some uh, some changes. Uh, but what he's done, he's taken Saudi Arabia in a whole different direction uh, over the last seventy years, and it, it's it's not that the Saudi Arabians' leaders and their kings have been altar boys, yeah. uh, have been saints. But, but what he's done is he's taken it to a whole different level. And I'm not sure the, 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 the senior Saudis, starting with the king, are that enamored uh, with what he's done. 
he's put the Saudis in a very tough spot yeah. around the world. I mean, nobody trusts him. Nobody will, I mean, starting with the United States. Yeah. Uh, and that Khashoggi thing, as you know, that had such an effect on, on the world. But he's done a, a many, many other things as well. So we're pulling a, a, a major missile battery out. We're pulling fighter jets out. Uh, we're stopping some, some uh, military orders that deals that have been made. Uh, and I think these are very clear signs to, to MBS to he, he, better, he better turn this ship around. But I'm not sure he's capable of doing that. Yeah. This is a question for me. Oh my. Good. What is my analysis? <laughs> we'll give you a yeah. minute. Uh, what is your analysis of how the most recent election played out? What should we, wait a minute, I gotta open it. Come on, open up, please. Uh, open. Uh, now maybe I, maybe I can ask you questions from here on. <laughs> uh, yeah. what, what is your analysis of how the most recent election played out? What can we expect? What should we watch out for? If you're in touch with reformists in Iran, what are they saying or feeling? Well, interesting you should mention that because we had this event yesterday um, at the Atlantic Council, a big discussion. We had uh, really interesting experts, including a professor from Tehran named uh, Sadat Ziba Kalam, really interesting guy, reformist somebody who advocates Iran, that Iran recognize Israel and the United States and uh, you know, get rid of all this, this the rhetoric and the policies of the last 40 years, essentially. And I was feeling very depressed after the election because, you know, Raisi is Raisi, talking about thugs. And um, actually, Ziba Kalam cheered me up. He said, look how we managed to show the system how angry we were yeah. by First of all, less than 50% even bothered to go to the polling place. And of that, something like uh, 13 million people voted, quote unquote, they put in ballots, but the ballots were either blank or they were spoiled. One, one person voted for Batman. <laughs> so they basically gave the finger, shall we say, in polite discourse, uh, to their yeah. own government and said, you want to engineer this? Fine. We don't have to participate. We don't have to show that we're loyal to this system. And uh, so he was actually feeling fairly yeah. good. I said, okay, what comes next? Because you know people have tried so many different ways to change the system peacefully in that country. The whole reform movement that came with Mohammed Hatimi in 1997. Uh, really opened the place up to you know newspapers and, and, and ideas, real clash of ideas and so on. But that was suppressed. And then um, we've seen demonstrations, huge ones after uh, elections in 2009 where the results were, were played with, uh, huge, huge demonstrations. We've seen demonstrations in 2019 by poor Iranians complaining about the price of chicken and the price of eggs, all put down very, very harshly uh, by, the, by the system. So I said, what do you do? How do you? How do you go forward? You know, he said, I don't know, but we will, you know, we will find a way. We're not going to give up. We're going to continue to make our feelings known. We're going to continue to make our voices heard. And, and we will do it ourselves. And he also said, and I think this is a real warning to the regime changers out there. He said, we don't want interventions. We don't want to turn up mm -hmm. like, we don't want to be mm -hmm. like Syria or Libya. Or, or Iraq. We have to do this ourselves. He said that otherwise we would be going from the frying pan into the fire. And you mentioned tribalism. I mean, Iran may be a little more than 50% ethnic Persian, but they're Arabs, they're Baluch, they're Kurds, they're Azeris, there are a lot of smaller groupings, yeah. they're religious minorities, and so on. And he said, you know, Iranians, he said, are a little bit racist. They like to think they're superior to the Arabs. He said, we're not, you know, and we can be at each other's throats in the same way that Arabs are at each other's throats in countries like Syria. So I took that as a, as a yeah, you know, both a, a way to feel better and a way to feel, you know, nervous uh, about what may happen in Iran over the next few years if this Raisi government cannot uh, bring at least some economic improvement to the country. Um, the other thought I have is that I think Raisi will be risk averse because this is a guy who has his eye on becoming yeah. supreme leader. 
So I don't think we're going to see uh, military adventures. I mean, they'll maintain their alliances, but I don't think they're going to really stir the pot. And, and I also think that, I mean, he is, he's somebody who's very cautious. He's not like Ahmadinejad. He's not going to say crazy yeah, things. Yeah. Uh, he's not interested in personal attention. He's not a Trump type, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, as Ahmadinejad was in his yep, own way. Yep. So that may give us a little bit more stability. I'm, n I'm not sure. Well, I think you're exactly right. I, I think you're exactly right on that. It's, it's kind of like what we talked about earlier. It's a new generation. That he, that he's got a- He's 60. He's an Iran-Iraq <clears throat> war vet. Uh, yeah. He's you know product of the Iran-Iraq war. They, they've, yeah. got to, they've got to get their economy put back together. Or they're going to have major problems. Yeah. I have a question for you about Afghanistan and whether you think Ashraf Ghani's uh, government is going to survive. I mean, every time I pick up yeah. the paper, it looks like uh, the Taliban have taken over something else and another, yeah. uh, another Afghan unit has surrendered or, or been massacred. Well, uh, Afghanistan is in for a, a tough time. Uh, but this isn't just starting as a result of us uh, yeah. pulling our troops out the last few months. I mean, last year when the Trump administration started negotiations with the Taliban and uh, they left the Ghani government out, which I think was a huge mistake. It was the wrong thing. It's the same thing we did in Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. Oh, did we? Yeah. Uh, and then we came back, came back and told the South Vietnamese, this is, this is the deal. Yeah. It's the same thing we did with the Afghans and left the poor Ghani government just dangling. When we did that, that was so wrong. Yeah. Uh, we sent a very clear signal to the Taliban. Yeah. It's all over. Yeah. I mean, we can say what we want in supporting Ghani and the Afghan people, but when we did that, cut them out, uh, that was the signal. But bring it forward now. At that point, when we started those negotiations early last year uh, in Qatar, at the uh, Taliban was already in control of more than half of the country. This according to our intelligence, more than half of the country. This is after 20 years of us pouring $2 trillion in there to build roads and businesses and support them and so on. And still the Taliban it was stronger than it had ever been in 20 years. So of course they're gonna just continue that momentum and, yeah. and we're leaving. And you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm astounded at that we never ever shifted uh, our approach. And I was Secretary of Defense at the time, and I used to ask about this. Uh, all the maintenance for their aircraft yeah. was done by American paid contractors. Yeah. So they never learned how. So they never learned how. Yeah. And so now we're pulling our contractors out too. I mean, everybody's leaving. Yeah. And so how do we maintain anything? How do we do anything? I, I was always just stunned by that, that we didn't do that. So they're in for a tough time. Uh, but in the end, it's going to have to be uh, an accommodation government, I suspect. It's going to have to be the people who are going to have to deal with it. Um, we're going to continue to support them economically in every way we can. But uh, I think it's going to be a, it's going to be very difficult. Yeah, I, I'm thinking of, uh, I believe it's Ross Wilson, who's there now as our ambassador. Yeah. He's a former colleague at the Atlantic Council yeah. and an absolutely Good guy. Uh, terrific person and yeah. incredibly, uh, incredibly brave uh, to take to take that position. Yeah. Uh, so I am looking at my agenda here. I think we have had our our last question from the audience. Wow. Um, uh, yeah. It went fast as I it knew did. it would. <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's um, always a pleasure to have you as a, as a guest and wherever it's been, uh, you know, uh, all the places that we have interacted yeah. over the last uh, 20, 25 years. Uh, and um, I know people talk a lot about the blob and about the foreign policy <laughs> establishment in Washington, <laughs> but people were not all evil. I no, mean, some no. of us, you know, <laughs> some of us really care and really do re-examine our views from time to time and are not always uh, set in stone. And, uh, no, you're, you're and right. you, you are certainly one of the ones who, who has always been uh, willing to learn and to listen uh, more than most, um, which is a rare quality uh, well, in thank this you. town. Well, thank you, Barbara, I appreciate that. I just, my last comment would be, and I know you feel this way, uh, I still have uh, great confidence in this country, the world, hope, uh, for the future, 
I'm not one who said, oh my God, it's all coming apart. Yeah. Big issues, big problems, big challenges. But hell, this country's always had big challenges. Yeah. I mean, we've always faced them. Uh, we've got a good, good people. Our people are good in this country. We've got a constitution. We self-correct. We have 27 amendments to the constitution because we didn't get it all right the first time. And we're still working on getting it right. So I've got great confidence in, the, in our future and I, I'm not Pollyannish about it. I'm a realist, but uh, we'll get through it. Yeah. Well, I think those are great words to close on. So let me thank the World yeah. Affairs Council of San Francisco, yeah. the Pacific Council, on international policy, uh, Jerry, Megan, everybody who helped put this uh, mm. together. And thank you for actually being able to be <laughs> in a room yeah. with a human being talking. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's still, kind, it's still kind of a unique experience. So uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thank and you. I guess we are, we are done. It's a wrap. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks.